song that we're going to sing today. You know it already. Let it rise. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. I would like to do one of the verses in Spanish in another language. So I want to just teach that to you before it comes up on the screen and you're like, what's going on? I think it's so cool to sing in other languages and I'm, I'm not a Spanish scholar by any means, but if you wouldn't mind putting up the the verse in Spanish, okay? So if you want to say this with me, que la gloria del Señor. You say that? Que la gloria del Señor exaltamos, all right? And it's the same words as the English, let the glory of the Lord rise among us. And then alabanza ante el rey levantamos. <laughs> you can do it. And then we're going to sing, O oh, Alabad. All right? Maybe we'll, maybe we'll start with that just to practice, and then we'll go back to the top of the song. So it goes like this. Que la gloria del Señor exaltamos. Que la gloria del Señor exaltamos. Alabanza ante el rey levantamos. Alabad. Do that again. Que la gloria del Señor exaltamos. Que la gloria del Señor exaltamos. Alabanza ante el rey levantamos. Alabad. Oh, we say, oh, alabad. Yes, Lord. in English. <laughs> Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Yes, Lord, we praise you today. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Yes, we need you, Lord. Oh, let it rise. Yes, Lord. Oh, oh, oh let it rise. But the glory, but the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of our King rise among us. Let it rise. Oh, let's praise Him and thank Him. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Yes, Lord. Oh, let it rise. Oh, 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 oh,
keep playing. You know, the Lord doesn't just want our words or just our voices or just our instruments. But what really catches his attention is, is our heart of worship. Is, is, you know, are we speaking the language of, of love to him, of, of really lifting him up um, in our songs? And I was encouraging the team, you know, we lead in songs and with our instruments and with words. But I, what I really believe the Lord wants to hear us all together today, singing to him as a song of praise from our hearts, not just our lips. Amen. Amen. I just want to make this song a prayer as we end it. That the glory of the Lord would really rise among us as we, as we lift him up. Thank you, Jesus, that you're already on the throne. And it's just us aligning our hearts and our vision with where you are to see what you're doing. We just thank you, Lord. All right, let's sing this one more time together. Let the glory the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord let it rise among us. Let the praises of our King rise among us. Let it rise. Yes, let the songs, let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us. Let it rise, so oh, let it rise, oh, let it rise, oh, we worship you, Lord, oh, let it rise, oh, let it rise, oh, let it rise, yes, Jesus. you Jesus I'm going to ask Patty to come up she had something on her heart that um, just from our time of prayer to share and it's so powerful good morning morning okay this morning in prayer um, we were all of us are very much being transparent with one another a lot of people were sharing needs that they had in their lives or circumstances or their feelings of maybe self-worth or the enemy badgering them, but um, we all found that our resolution to get us out of that place and those needs met was in Jesus. And um, when we were talking about the name of Jesus, this is what I wanted to share with you. Um, there's a descriptive name and there's a designated name. For example, my designated name is Patty Jane Bowman, but I have a descriptive names as well. I am a wife. I'm a mother, I'm a nurse, I'm a teacher, I'm a friend, I'm a sister. So whatever your need might be, if you have need for teaching, you'd come to me as, the, uh, as me being the teacher, right? If you have some need for TLC, you might come to me as the mother or the nurse component of me. Are you with me? And when we speak a name, it conjures up who that person is. Like if I said to you, President Trump, or Abraham Lincoln, it conjures up an image or a character or nature of that person, correct? So if I say to you the name of Jesus, I am is the Lord's um, designated name. Jesus, Lord, Jehovah, you know, however Yahweh you would say that, but I am. Jesus is his designated name. His descriptive name is healer, peace, savior, um, light of the world, um, bread, you know, um, whatever your need is, the Bible says there's over 700 descriptive names of the Lord. And it's endless. Whatever need is in your life, the designated person to meet the need is Jesus. Amen. And if he reveals those names as descriptive of him, that reveals who he is, correct? And if he's revealing who he is, you have to think, why is he revealing who he is? He's revealing who he is because he's saying that need is met in him. 
he is the provision for that need. But then the enemy might go as far as to say, well, that's true, but it's not for you. And I would say to you, it is for you. Every descriptive name that he has given us, healer, peace, counselor, um, whatever need is in your life, he is the designated person to meet that need. And we're going to go into some songs here of worship that really focus on the name of Jesus. So if there is a need in your life, I believe that in our praise and our worship and our focus on him, that need will be met today as you focus on who he is and who has declared himself to be.
Jesus. Lord, we just thank you of was so beautifully shared, but of everything that is encompassed in your name. And even just the power of of, of speaking the name Jesus and of, of fixing our eyes on you, Lord. And I just pray that that as we worship in this place, that we could fix our eyes on you. And that if we're not seeing our, our life or our circumstances the way that you would see them, that we would see them like you see them, Lord. We just thank you for hope and trust restored as we walk together with you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that in those names, Lord, that you embody hope, that you embody trust, Lord. You are perfect in every way, and we look to you, Lord. We we depend on you. We rely on you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you that we draw from the power of your Holy Spirit alive in each one of us who who knows your name, who who calls you our Lord and Savior and our friend. Thank you, Jesus. Were the word at the beginning One with God the Lord most high Your hidden glory in creation and now revealed in you, oh Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name. heaven without us so Jesus you brought heaven down thank you Lord my sin was great your love was greater and what could separate us now what a wonderful name it is what a wonderful name it is Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Oh, nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. Oh, yeah. Yes, it is, Lord. Oh, at your name, every tongue confess, every knee will bow. Declare that you are Lord. You're so powerful, and death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin there. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. Yes, and you have no rival, you have no equal. Yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is, oh, nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of You have no rival. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is 
the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a powerful name it is, oh nothing can what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of soak up your presence right now we just stand in your presence we just thank you for the price that you paid to be connected to us Lord the price you paid in dying on the cross the price you paid in in, in living in, in a human body and experiencing everything that we experience we thank you Lord for beating the, de the grave, Lord, beating death. We thank you for rising again, and we just thank you for all of the hope that we have in you. So we don't just look back on what you did for us, Lord. We look forward to the future that you have, your kingdom that will never end. Everything else will fade away, Lord, but you will not. We just thank Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And we're going to sing an old song about the name of Jesus, but I just felt so impressed in my heart just to share whatever. It's been, it's been shared today, but whatever you're, you're calling out to the Lord for, call out his name and, 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 and call on him and and his heart is that you would know him in the fellowship of his sufferings and the power of his resurrection, that you would be connected with him, that you would love him. We can do so many things in the name of religion, of just doing them because we think we should. But what power is there in relationship with Jesus and, and in loving him and if you don't have that with Jesus, he wants you to. 
to call on him as a friend, to call on him all throughout the day, all throughout the week, to learn, learn of him from his word, from spending time in his presence. And I was sharing with the, with the team just at one point of many in my life where I found myself at the end of all of my emotions, the emotions that sometimes help us, make us feel like we want to worship, feel like we want to praise, I had absolutely none of them. And I would go in my college dorm room and I would shut the door. And it felt like pulling teeth, but I would just praise Jesus and and sing to him. This is one of the songs that I sang. And I didn't always feel better right away, but I knew that, that he was there for me. And when I look back now, and when I look back on the times where I have waited for the Lord to show up in my pain. He always came through for me. He was always there surrounding me with his presence. Even if it felt like 11.59 p.m., he always came through. He is faithful. Don't give up waiting on him. Thank you, Jesus. Let's sing this together. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name, Master, Savior, Jesus, like a fragrance after thank you for the strong sense of your presence and I know that it's your heart 
that we wouldn't just practice this or sense this on Sunday mornings, but that we could call out to you, sing your praises even if we can't carry a tune, put on worship music, open your word, that we could decide to invite you and your powerful presence into our lives every single day. Lord, I, I pray for this congregation of believers, Lord, that whatever their daily life looks like, that it could be offered up to you. It could be surrendered to you. It could be, it could even take a turn of being more joyful, of being filled with your presence, Lord, because you are everything wonderful and everything beautiful. And I pray that we could take our jobs, we could take our 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 um our children. Um, just the situations and, and, and the roles that, that we all have, all the different things that our names mean when they get called, um, that it could all be surrendered to you. And it's, it's, not, it's not in our own human strength, but it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray that there would just be new hope, new hope for when we wake up in the morning and we put our feet down on the ground. We just thank you and we praise you, Lord, for another day. We thank you just that you're you're never going to leave us or forsake us. And we thank you for new vision of hope, new new ideas, new... Lord, you're, you're on the horizon with, with, with smiles and, and with arms open wide, and you're a good father, and you have good plans for us. Your word tells us that you have good plans for us, plans not to harm us, but plans to give us a hope and a future. And we thank you for that word in Jeremiah, Lord. We just received that, Lord. I pray you'd heal our hearts. You'd lift any doom or shame or depression off of us. We just rejoice in you and we thank you, Lord. Thank you for that name of Jesus. What a powerful name. Thank you, Jesus. Good morning, church. Feel free to have a seat. What an incredible sense of God's presence with us this morning. Amen? You know what I'm reminded of this morning is um, Paul and Timothy in the prison. They did not wait for their circumstances to line up when they started praising. They didn't wait for everything to calm down. They didn't wait for everything to line up. They just started praising God in the middle of the chaos. Aren't you glad that we serve a God who's worthy of our praise no matter what's going on? Aren't you glad that God hears us even when our minds are going crazy and everything is going crazy all around us? I am. All right. Jesus, we thank you for your goodness. God, I just thank you again for your faithfulness. You are so faithful. Lord, continue to turn our eyes to you throughout the rest of our time together this morning, God. Amen. Amen. The ushers are going to come and serve us by collecting the offering. Thank you so much for doing that. There's a couple of different ways you can give. You can give by check. You can make that out to Hillside Christian Fellowship. You can give by cash. There's envelopes in the back if you want us to have a record of your giving. And you can also give online through our website, through PayPal. By the way, it's a great way to give if you're going to be out of town. Uh, It's a great way to give even regularly. I don't know about you, but all of my bills, I I try to pay regularly where Abby pays them. I don't really do the banking. And it's a lot easier when it's set up as a regular thing. So you can do that through our website, through PayPal couple things I want to share with you about is that next week, everybody say next week. Next week, we're going to be having a baby shower for the Bostorfs. They have had, they are, have a unique opportunity to foster, to adopt again, and they have been incredibly generous with their lives. Amen. I can't imagine that. You guys are amazing, and we want to be generous towards them. And so there's an opportunity that we have to give towards them as they provide for their baby. There's uh, information out in the foyer. There's cards with different things that they're looking for, diapers and wipes and a whole bunch of stuff. Please uh, be as generous to them as God's been to you. Be as generous to them as they are being towards this baby that they have. So grab a card. Grab a couple cards. Maybe grab even more than what your finances feel like you, they can be and give towards them, and then plan to stay after our service for a cake reception to celebrate with us. The next thing I want to tell you about is that on October 13th, two Sundays from now, we're going to be having a membership class. How many of you are members? You're part of the family of Hillside. Raise your hands. Wave them around at me. 
All right, there we go. If you are not yet a member and you want to know what membership is, what does it mean to be a part of this family here at Hillside, I'd encourage you to come to the class in two weeks from now. There's going to be lunch. Uh, You're going to hang out with Pastor Steve and hear more about the church. I would encourage you to do that. If you want to come, you can let us know by signing up in the foyer, or you can sign up on Facebook and respond to that event. The week after, we've got three weeks in a row of parties, friends. The week after is our fall fellowship at the spots. It is from 1 to 5, and it's going to be an awesome time. I don't know what the plans are yet, but I remember last year we had hay rides, we had campfires, there was so much food. It's going to be a great time. So please make plans to join us for it. And uh, there's information. You can bring a covered dish to share, so you can sign up and let us know you're coming and sign up for what you're going to bring out in the foyer. Last thing is that it is almost October, right? we got two more days left in September, if my math is correct. And at the end of October is what I call Reformation Day. Some people call it Halloween, um, All Saints Day. But it's a day where there's a lot of darkness around. People try to celebrate darkness. People try to scare other people. It's not always a very fun night. And so what we've done in the past is this really cool thing where we redeem the night. We go back to... um, Rather than run away and hide away in our houses or hide away in the church, we're out in the middle of the culture, in the middle of our cities, in the middle of our neighborhoods, sharing the hope and the goodness of Jesus. And so what that looks like is that we want to throw a party in people's yards, and we bring lots of LED lights, bright lights and candy and bounce houses and things like that. If you are interested in having your home be a host home for this, if, here's a good way to know, if there's a lot of traffic around your house, around um, trick-or-treat day, let us know, talk to us in the office, and we will get you hooked up with everything you need to host Light the Night. All right. I don't know if you saw, by the way, but um, there was a Johnny Appleseed that came to Upper Dauphin earlier this week, and I did not get a chance to put it in, but go on Facebook later on, and you can see Pastor Steve dressed up like Johnny Appleseed. I almost forgot to dismiss the kids. Kids, come on up. Come on up to be dismissed back to class. Hi. How's it going? Boom. It's wonderful to see you all this morning. All right, is there a children's ministry teacher that's going to share about today? Becky Jo, can you tell us what's happening today? Since the message is deeply rooted, I feel that we are all deeply rooted in God, and with God, we're supposed to plant our roots. So for our craft today, I've cut out little flowers, or little trees for the kids, and I brought in some yarn that they can undo to make into long roots that go deep down so that we get our roots deeply into the soil of God. Thank you, Becky Jo. So Jesus, would you do that work of rooting our kids in you? Lord, we pray for deep roots, for good soil, and for an incredible harvest to come, Lord. Thank you for the time they're going to have today. Amen. All right. Love you guys. See you later. You know, Johnny Appleseed is one of those, um, I do go into Kim Messinger's class to be Johnny Appleseed because I get an opportunity to bring a Bible into a public school <laughs> and tell the kids. It's one of those stories. Johnny Appleseed was a preacher. He, and, and, you know, as many legends do, there was a truth about him that he preached. Yeah, he planted apple orchards and did that kind of stuff too. But he went in preaching. He was a, um, I forget what group he was with. But one of those crazy splinter on fire for Jesus groups. So he was a real deal preacher and he'd sit in people's houses wherever he went evangelizing. So he'd, he had no home, really he'd traveled, wandered different places, would go into a home, tell stories about Jesus, tell stories about his adventures in the wilderness too. But he was a gospel preacher and that's one of those stories that, that belongs to us. That's one of our bros right there. He did some good stuff. He wasn't just some goofy guy with a tin pot hat and what not. You know how the enemy does that, though? The enemy takes great heroes of the faith, people who have done amazing and awesome things, and tries to minimize them, write them out of the history books. The last thing that the accuser of the brethren wants is for a son of God to be glorified in some way. Did you know that God wants to glorify us? 
That was an actual survey question. I'm gauging how far into this we need to go today. Yes, he does want to glorify us. He doesn't want to diminish us. He wants to glorify us. How many of you already have been diminished about as far as you could get? Anybody else? You know, it's like humble thyself in the sight of the Lord and he'll exalt you in due season. How many of you know if you don't humble yourself, other things will. Life comes at you fast. We have an accuser who's hot on our tail, always looking to diminish the sons and daughters of God, make us a, a ridicule instead of the most glorious creatures in all of God's creation, which we are. We are the crowning achievement of God's creative power. <clears throat> you know, like looking at pictures of the Hubble Space Telescope and some of these other things now that are doing these deep looks into the universe. I just saw the other day they discovered three black holes that are circling around, shredding all the stars, and they're going to eat each other. And they're, they're like trillions of light years wide. <clears throat> are you guys as impressed with that as I am? I'm looking at that going, wow, that is just massive. I mean, it looks like, they look like just this goofy little black IP on a picture. But they're massive. They're beyond human comprehension. And you know how they came into existence? Because on the fourth day, God said, let there be some stars in the heavens. That's it. Just like that, like as an off the go, hey, it'd be kind of cool to have some stars out there. And bam, there's all this stuff like that. That's massive. That's worth, I mean, it makes you, the, what I just did is giving glory to something. I'm amazed at it. I'm looking at it. Wow, look at that. That is just incredible. But what's more amazing than that is that when God made the first one of us, and then, he, and then he pulled the female part out of the first one of us and said, you two are one flesh, two being one. That's a crazy mystery. He said, now that is my crown. That, that is, if you want to see my glory, that's what a crown means. This is the glory, right? Whatever sits on your head. The glory of a king is the crown that he wears. He could be the most ugly, you know, four foot ten, nobody with leprosy and, you know, whatnot. But as soon as he puts that crown on the head, all the glory belongs to that king, right? So the crowning glory of God's creation was us. Now stop, let's just, we're going to put to death the spirit of false humility. False humility is when we think of ourselves so much that we think we have to belittle ourselves when God on purpose said, I'm coming inside you to lift you up. He lifts the needy from the ashes and sits them up with princes. He doesn't take his children, and put them down as if we're stealing some of his glory. There's only a little bit of glory to go around, guys, and y'all are robbing me of my glory right now. You know, a father is best glorified when his kids are glorified. You want to see how awesome God is? Look at how awesome his kids are. And we are awesome. See, even like some of you, I can tell you, wiggling in your seat, like, no, that sounds so proud. That's pride. You can't say I'm awesome. Yes, you can if it's agreeing with what God says. That's always a good idea, right? It's always a good idea to agree with what God says because anything that disagrees with what God says is what we call a demonic stronghold. And I want to talk about those today. Hopefully uncover some of those today. Because some of us have made like a peace treaty with demonic strongholds, which I'll show you is a way of thinking that argues with God's way of thinking. That's what a demonic stronghold is. So, so when we live that way and we believe those kind of things, we diminish what God wants to glorify. Always a bad idea. So let me back up and lay a little foundation for where we're going today because we're still talking about our mission in the earth and our purpose for being here, which is to restore paradise. That's why we're here. We are going to make this earth look like Eden never got messed up in the first place by the time we're through with it. How many of you believe that so far? Oh, we got a ways to go. Hey, it is all up to you how long this series goes because the Lord and I are going to be on it. I, I am on a mission from God. But God spoke this to me earlier in the year. There's this whole thing about having a vision. Without a vision, people cast off restraint. If we don't have vision for why we exist, vision for whatever it is that we do as part of a grand master plan, then really we end up in saying, well, what's the point? What's the point of striving and resisting the devil if at the end of the day, God's just going to torch everything here anyway? What's the point? 
What's the point in loving consistently and persistently those that oppose us, those that are absolutely against us and rail against us? What's the point if our mission in the earth is not to see the entirety of the world renewed, to be just like it was meant to be in the first place and actually even better, even better than it was in the first place? If you think I'm crazy, you got to back up like 12 weeks and start over again. With, I've been, uh, That's why, I don't know if you've noticed, I've had more scriptures to share than usual. I've been in teacher mode for much longer than usual because I feel like this is so important. I feel such a, a passion from the Lord about this subject and that we all get it and agree with it. I can't impart this mindset to the entire body of Christ around the world. Praise God, there are a lot of voices saying the same things right now on the earth, reminding the sons and daughters of God that we are sons and daughters of God. We're not just some sinners saved by grace waiting for the bus. No, we've been renewed and the earth is crying out for the manifestation of the sons and daughters of God. The earth literally is tired of being under this curse. It's tired of it. It's been at least 6,000 years or more since Adam and Eve messed it up and invited darkness into the Garden of Eden. And the earth ever since has been saying, can I be out from under this? I don't like bearing thorns. I don't like being hard and dry. And I don't like, you know, fighting Adam as he tries to cultivate me. I was made to bear fruit. I was made to be lush and beautiful all over the places, not just in some vacation destination you got to pay five grand per for airfare to go and visit. I want to all be like this. I'm speaking on behalf of the earth right now. It's like the earth is crying out and say, would you guys please get on with it already? It's been thousands of years and I want to be free to be me. Earth gets to be free to be me when we get to be free to be me. Because what's inside of us right now is everything that the earth needs to be 100% renewed, to look just like Eden. So God's the source of all love. We're going to begin here. God is love, which means everything that God does is motivated by love because he can't be anything but love. Yes, there are things that God cannot do. You ever get into one of those goofy arguments with an atheist? Is there anything God can't do? Well, God can't sin, so there's something he can't do. You know? Man, you, you, just, you gotta get out from that book sometime and start living or something like that. Know, this is annoying. There, is, there are things God can't do. God cannot do anything without the motive of love. Let that sink in for a minute. You read the entire Bible, he's always been the same. Anything he has ever done has been with the motive of love. We may not understand the big picture of where God's going with this. Because sometimes it may not feel like that. But God is always motivated by love. And so he is the source of all love. God is love. He's the source of all life. He's the source of all light. And so he's the source of all love. So when our love originates in that place, we love, why? Because he first loved us. We received something from the God who is love. It filled us. It overwhelmed us. It made us do that crazy thing like come to the altar weeping and saying, I give you everything I have, always, forever. I'll go to Timbuktu. I'll go wherever you want. I'll even go to Brooklyn. I'll go anywhere because I love you because of what you just did for me, right? We prayed these crazy prayers like that. Why? Because love just broke into our heart and love is the greatest motivator of all. There is nothing that motivates a man more than trying to woo the woman. All you wives, say amen. You remember back to those days when the man couldn't look at anybody but you. And he, we did the craziest things. I drove to Indiana. I was in Long Island, New York. My wife was in, my future wife was in Upland, Indiana. And we were both crazy busy in our schedules. I had less than 48 hours free. It was the middle of February. Not Valentine's Day. I knew better than not doing this on Valentine's Day. I wasn't cheesy enough to propose on Valentine's Day. But I hopped in my little Toyota Tercel. Right? The seat was, you know, for 18 hours of a drive through New York City, across Pennsylvania, across Ohio, which is so boring to drive, you know? It's like you get to one end of the state and you can see the other side from the border and it never gets closer. It's like, when am I going to be there? And then you got these mile markers, so you count every mile. 
Great. So I had less than 48 hours. I'm driving there with my entire life savings embodied in this ring that's sitting on the passenger seat. And I'm, I'm singing at the top of my lungs out the window so I won't fall asleep because I had to get there because she only had about an hour and a half window for her friend to drive her to the secret place where I was going to propose to her. I stood there. She was late. She's not here, right? Which is typical. <laughs> late as usual for her own engagement, which she didn't know was happening in fairness to her. She was an hour and a half late. By the time she got there, all of my toes were blue. I was standing in an inch of snow. It was blowing, and I was wearing a suit. I had the flowers in my hand. They were frozen. I said, boo, 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 you marry me. <laughs> the things we do for love, there is no greater motivator than love. God knows that. That's why God is love. That's why we can't be motivated by anything more strongly than we can by love. Whatever we do for the Lord, whatever we do for those around us, whatever we do for our friends, enemies, family, and everybody in between, whatever we do, when we aim <clears throat> and grow in our ability to love and have that be our motive, now we're restoring paradise in the earth. So we originate and we derive our enduring power from the God of love. Now, how many married people can say amen that you started awesome and then you found where your love ran out? You found that certain behavior or you found that habit <clears throat> or you found that thing that reminds you of something that you hate in your spouse and then you realize, ooh, my love, my love has limits. Don't look at me like that. You all know what I'm talking about. Your lo our love has limits. Our love has a certain place where we get to, and it's, <clears throat> that's a deal breaker. So I'm now going to withhold my love because of what just happened. I'm pulling back because uh, we have control, right? We have the will power to give or withhold our love anytime we want to. Saints, there is nobody outside of us that controls anything that we do. <clears throat> That's just a true statement worthy of all acceptance, like Paul would say it. We, nobody controls us. We control we. I control me. You control you, right? So we, we, we get into these situations then where we find out that I don't have the strength to love right now. To forgive that person right now, I don't feel like I have the capacity to do that. Has anybody else ever been there? Yes, I did say else. <clears throat> I don't feel like I could ever trust that person again. I don't feel like I could look that person in the eye with sincerity and even say, I love you. Some of our marriages have been in that place. Some of our closest friendships have been in that place. Some of our closest friendships and marriages have ended with a firm cutoff. I'm getting you out of my life forever. I don't care if I never see you again. So we find where our love has limits. But when our love has its source... In the God who is love, we have a never-ending supply. And there's, there's this pride thing and there's this humility thing that says, God, I know that my love is empty right now. I don't have it. I don't have it. Even for this one that I couldn't imagine ever stopping love for. I don't have it right now. I need you. Now we have all the love necessary to reestablish paradise in the earth. Beginning in here, and then spreading to our closest relationships, and then getting out there into the world that we are destined to restore into paradise. So I want to talk about strongholds today because they're, they're these things that get in the way of love. Bottom line of strongholds is they interfere with our capacity to love God, to live in this love relationship, and they interfere with our ability to love even our enemies. When Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, he wasn't throwing down some gauntlet like, you'll never be able to do that, and I know it. You ever play um, Follow the Leader? Game Follow the Leader? We used to play it in gymnastics class at the boys' club I grew up in. And, uh, you know, when you play Follow the Leader, there's always one kid who could just do stuff that nobody else could do, right? Like, we had this kid, I forget his name now. I want to say Isaiah, but I don't know if that's right. And he could do, like, double flips on the trampoline, and he could do round off back handspring, back flip on regular mats, not on, like, a, one of those springy gym floors. He was just crazy, eight years old. We all thought he was going to the Olympics. So we all hated it when we had to follow. We used to play follow the leader to challenge ourselves, and nobody, everybody hated it when he was the guy. 
And so all of us would say, yeah, whatever. And throw our hands up and I ain't even going to try it because he'd go like some cartoon character. And sometimes when we look at Jesus' life, <clears throat> we look at the way he responded to people and we look at the way that he never failed to express love. You ever get that feeling? Like I had trying to follow that kid and follow the leader. Like I can never attain to that. So what's the point of trying? I'm throwing up my hands and I'm walking away from love now. I'm walking away from a demand that feels like it's been placed on me to do something that I don't have the capacity to do. So we have these moments and they make us sometimes try to make us believe anyway that we haven't been fundamentally transformed from the inside out. You ever get into those situations, right, where you, your love's run dry and now you're, you're, now you're just restraining yourself not to exercise hatred and take revenge on somebody. You're, you're exercising a wrestling match in your mind not to wish like a meteor will fall on their house or something like that, right? You're, you're battling in your mind in those moments. And here's what the enemy then comes in to do. First of all, of course, you know the enemy's involved in that, stirring up hatred, fueling that animosity. You know that you're wrestling with principalities and powers at that moment. But then he comes in and says this. Tell me if you've ever heard this one before. You're no different than you were when Jesus found you. You're still dealing with this? You call yourself a mature saint of God? You're a teacher or a preacher? You're an example? You're a father or mother? You teach Sunday school? You go out and tell your, your office that you're a Christian? <laughs> yeah, and look at the thoughts that are going through your mind. You ever hear that one? I'm not quoting Jesus right now, by the way. That's the devil. That's how you know, because our nature is love. It's not who we are. There's something different that's happened on the inside of us. So the fact that we, we fall short in our love response to people, that sometimes we don't exercise and follow through the way that, you know, you ever, <laughs> like maybe you do this around holidays and you're, you, can't, you get psyched up, right? You get psyched up in Jesus, for that family gathering where you know you're going to have to face that relative that is always mean and offensive. So you get yourself all jacked up for it and you go in prepared and, and you go in, yeah! And within five minutes you fall short. Am I the only one? I'm hearing some nervous laughs, nods of agreement, I'm not sure. So you go in and you realize, oh, I did it again, I ended in my capacity. Well, today I want to tell you the secret of not needing to rely on our own selves to be able to succeed in those kind of moments. And the first thing is to believe this truth, that falling short in love doesn't mean that we haven't been transformed from the inside out. It doesn't change the fact of the reality of who we are because we are who God says we are. When God says, you're this, that's what we are. Anything other than that is a demonic stronghold which is trying to exalt itself above God's knowledge of us. God does not speak empty promises. God doesn't speak empty words of encouragement. If God declares something, it's true. And even if our eyes, you know, we have this phrase, and it, it's kind of funny to say, you're going to believe me or you're going to believe your lying eyes which is what people usually say when they're obviously doing something wrong and they're lying about what they've done. That's not what God's like. When God speaks a truth that we can't yet perceive with our eyes, it is true, it's right, it's always spot on. And why, why God says it to us is because he wants to give us a vision for what's on the inside and the unseen so that we could go for it, manifest what's on the inside and become that which God sees on the inside already. So we are who God says we are. Every lie that we believe from the kingdom of darkness that says, now nah, you weren't even really saved. Or maybe you need to get saved again. Maybe you need to get baptized for the umpteenth time. And maybe you'll get it right this time. That's all from a whole other realm than where we live. Here's what God says. If anyone's in Christ, he is not one day you will achieve and become a new creation or a new creature. He is a new creature. How many of you are new creatures? That was a good response that time. He is a new creature. The old things passed 
away. Past tense. Passed away. Behold, new things, they're going to get there eventually. New things have come. That's the reality. If anything in your mind argues with that and says something like, well, you know, you don't know what I just did. Or you don't know what I was just thinking. Or you have no idea the kind of stuff that I would do if I didn't have any restraint. You're arguing with the Word of God. Or something in you, I should say, is arguing with the Word of God. And that's what we call a stronghold. Something's arguing with the truth of God. New things have come. He made him to be no, to, uh, to, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Why? Did Jesus do that already? That's a yes. No trick questions here, I promise. No trick questions. Did that happen already? This is the cross, right? Jesus became the full embodiment of everything to do with sin for all time. Crucified it and said it's finished. Why? So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Are you a sinner? No, you are not. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. Whether you agree with that statement or not, it's right. And if we disagree, we're wrong. That's a true statement. See, all, all moving into new, the new love that we've been called into, everything to do with living a life of love the way that God loves begins with that truth. If we don't believe the truth that we're actually transformed on the inside, that we are not who we used to be, that we're not just sinners who are saved by grace and desperate everyday dependence, dependent on God or else we're just a wretch, if we just believe that we're the same we used to be, then we'll never dive into this whole new covenant love life. It, it just won't happen. Because we've got a built-in excuse not to press into his presence for the love we need when we need it. Not to press in, I should point right here, press in to his love whenever we need it. We'll, we'll just say, well, you know, I'm, I'm only human. You ever use that one? Yes, we all have. Well, I'm only human. No, you're not. We are not mere mortals anymore. Right? We've been born again of incorruptible seed. We were born with corruptible seed. But now we've been born again with incorruptible seed. We're not who we used to be. There's nothing inside of us that even remotely resembles who we used to be. It's just that we have some mindsets, <clears throat> and we have some habits, we have some means to satisfy cravings of our flesh. Do you know that not cravings of the flesh are not in and of themselves evil and sinful? God made us to need to eat. It's not sinful to be hungry. The sin comes in when we get into gluttony, when we get into thinking that food is more important than all the rest of us. That's where it goes off into another realm. The desires, or even our appetite for sex, there I said it in church again. Even our appetite for sex, that's not sinful in and of itself. It's just how we satisfy that that makes it sin or not. It's awesome in marriage, isn't it? Come on, husbands and wives, celebrate it to death. Make sure that our kids and this generation knows it is every bit as awesome as they say, but it's awesomer and it comes with no remorse when it's kept in the right place. Like somebody said, the fire is best when it stays in the fireplace. If it comes out the fireplace, you burn the house down. It's awesome. The craving itself, the desires are created. They're hardwired into us by God. It's all about how we satisfy those desires. So He satisfies our desire for good so that our years are renewed. Our youth is renewed like the eagle, right? He satisfies them. And when He satisfies them in His way, booyah, it's awesome. That's life. That's life and that more abundantly. And many of us have been there, done that with all the wrong ways. And we can testify just don't go there in the first place. So we became the righteousness of God in him. So our personal spiritual warfare, all spiritual warfare begins right in here and really right in here. This is where it all begins. Spiritual warfare, doesn't, we don't go up to the high places and tear the devil's kingdom down. That, I love Ron Cannoli, but that's just not how spiritual warfare happens. We win spiritual warfare by winning it in here and we displace darkness. They got no room to grow anymore. 
We just wrecked the foundations of hell. We ruined the soil so that they have no place to get rooted and established in a region. That's revival. That's when you know God's come. That's what we call an open heaven. Why is it open? Because principalities and powers aren't blocking the view anymore. They're not interfering with our ability to experience heaven on earth. This latter thing, like Jacob saw, this constant back and forth between heaven and earth, that's revival. So personal warfare is based on the reality that although we are God's righteousness incarnate, that means we are in the flesh God's righteousness. There's, there's a whole study, and I don't have time to break it all down, so can you just trust me for a minute? Do you trust me as a teacher of the word that I've studied and I don't, I don't need to break everything down? That flesh is not innately evil. When the scripture uses the term flesh to describe sin, it means satisfying our carnal appetites in a way that's not authorized by God. That's what sin, that's what, when, when the Bible says flesh, you got to read it in context. When it says flesh that way, that's what it means. I'm satisfying my sexual appetites with somebody who's not my wife. I'm satisfying my appetite for justice by taking revenge myself on somebody. Okay, so the, <clears throat> that's what flesh means. God created us in a flesh body. He didn't create us, a disembodied spirit stuck in a flesh body. That's a heresy we're looking at in the Gospel of John right now. Free plug commercial for the Gospel of John. We're only up to chapter 2. You didn't miss much. But we looked at that. That's a heresy. Why? Because the enemy hates this flesh. Because when God looked at the first flesh he created, Adam and Eve, he said, that is very good. And he told that very good flesh to have dominion over Satan and his kingdom itself. That's why the devil hates our flesh and why he knows I can't overpower them, but I'm going to tempt them to misuse it. All right. So we're God's right. We still contend, right? We still contend. Anybody else still contending? You still arguing with yourself? So whenever, whenever you got this thing that says, you know, part of me wants to do this and part of me thinks that, there are no two parts of you like that that argue with each other. <laughs> you know that? We are not spiritually schizophrenic. All right, there's no like personality disorder in the son or daughter of God. When we say part of me thinks this and part of me thinks that, one part is hearing God, the other part's wrestling with a lie that we've come to believe. That's what demonic strongholds are. So we get into this thing that Paul experienced, right? Tell me if you can relate. This is my favorite half chapter in the scripture to go to. Because it, it describes spiritual warfare and then out of this comes the most triumphant chapter in the entire New Testament. Right? All of you learn how to ruminate yet? Brian, that's Brian's word, right? Ruminate. Think about Romans 8, the truth of that. Here's the lead in to it. Paul acknowledges, even Paul the Apostle, author of half the New Testament, said, I'm still working this out too. I'm still works contending. You don't think that Paul wanted to slap some of those circum the Judaizers around a little bit? The people that would come behind him and undermine the church, make them all get circumcised and obey the law of Moses and put them back in religious dead works bondage? No, no, the, well, Paul did say, he slipped and said a couple of things about, you know, castrating themselves and whatnot, and I made it into the Bible. But Paul wrestled with stuff. And he said, the good that I want, I don't do but I practice the very evil that I do not want. Do you hear this? So it's something that I'm practicing, but I don't like it. I don't want to be doing this thing. I stumbled again. I made a mistake again. I fell into something that I've been set free from. But you know how you know you're born again? Because there's something in you that you don't need anybody to tell you that was wrong. Right? That careless word slipped out of your mouth. You just did something, and on the inside of you, you grieved about it, right? That's how you know you got the Spirit of God in there. That's how you know you've been renewed. Because before, you'd have just justified it. Before, or you wouldn't even have thought it was wrong. Well, that's just how we are. You know, I just I, I let that word of gossip slip and undermine somebody now in the mind of that person. Well, that's just how we are. You know, that's, that's just how we roll around here. But no, not anymore. Now there's something in there that's like, oh, I did not like that. I just did something I don't want to do. If I'm doing the very thing I don't want, I'm no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. That is a stronghold. Sin that dwells in me. It's not a part of me. It's not even connected to something in my body. 
It's like cancer that's growing in there. It's a foreign invader. It doesn't belong in here. It's like all the ites that lived in the promised land that belonged to Israel. It wasn't their territory anymore, but they were still living there. They weren't Israelites. They were never absorbed into their God said, destroy them all. I don't want that left. And that's exactly what God does in our heart. The sin that dwells in us, we get the radiation therapy of the sunlight. And it dissolves it. That's how we get rid of these things. So it's not us. Our nature, we didn't slip back into something that we were rescued from. We're just still wrestling with some stuff that's still trying to occupy territory. Some invaders in the promised land of our own heart. That's what it is. So I find this. Evil's present in me. The one who wants to do good. Why? I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. I love God's ways. Everything in me comes alive when I read the word. When his living word comes to my heart, it makes my whole body sing. I love everything that God loves and I've come to despise the things that God despises. I know that I love the God, so I've got this thing going on in the inside, but I see this other thing waging war against the law of my mind, trying to make me prisoner of the law of sin in my members. That means my body parts. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? Aren't you glad he didn't just stop right there? So many people have heard preach this and they stop right there. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? I'm stuck with this for the rest of my life. No, he isn't. We are not stuck with this. The good news is that we're not stuck with these strongholds. We're not stuck with sin that dwells in us. We don't have to make some peace treaty with it and say, well, I guess I'm going to be like this until Jesus comes back. Stop that stinking thinking. That is the, (laughs) Bill Johnson said, the spirit of stupid. That is not... That is not accurate. It's not right. We're not stuck with anything anymore. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord. We're set free from this stuff. This doesn't define us any longer. It only remains if we choose to let it remain. The first thing that got restored when we were born again, we were slaves to sin. What we got back was our free will. We have absolute control authority over our entire being. There are no chains to be found on the inside of a saint of God. I keep forgetting to put the picture up. I was going to do it again for this one. I forgot. But so this picture of a, a horse that was tied to one of those plastic lawn chairs. And it was just standing there like it had been tied up to a hitching post. That's what bondage is for a Christian. The only way that thing holds that horse in one place is because somehow in that horse's mind it believes that it's tied down. The only place that the kingdom of darkness ever gets a a stronghold in a saint of God is when we agree with its lies and deception. Like somehow I am stuck with this thing. There is no addiction. There is no sin issue. There is no whatever issue of unforgiveness. There's no issue anywhere in any way that we are stuck with for the rest of our lives. Thanks be to God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we're set free. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because the law of spirit and life in Christ Jesus set us free from the law of sin and death. We're not bound to those things. We are free. Now comes enforcement time. Now comes the time that we convince the rest of us that what God said is true and what we believe is wrong if we're arguing with the Lord about it. It's the fact that we're grieved over our sin that proves I have a new nature. Does your Bible, by the way, I've I've done this in classes before. I don't know if I've ever done it here for everybody. Open up your Bible for a second, all right? Can you look at Romans 7, that last half of the chapter right there? And I'm going to ask you to do something. If you don't believe in defacing the written word of God, you may not agree with this, and that's okay. I I won't be mad at you. If you have a digital Bible, you're not going to be able to do this. <laughs> Sorry. Does it say the war between two natures in your Bible? Is there like a, if you have the NASB, that section, Romans 7, starting in the middle of the chapter, and it says a war between two natures. It says that in my Bible. Like, and, and that, by the way, is not what Paul wrote. That's what a commentator translator did. Like, here's a section. This is about the war between new, new, two natures. Would you cross that out? 
Like, cross it out really mad on my behalf. Cross it out. There is no war between two natures. Steve did it already. Yes. There is no war between two natures going on in the inside of us, saints. We are not bipolar. We are not schizophrenic. There are not two natures. It's impossible to have two natures. By nature of what that word means. <laughs> Nature means this is your natural disposition. This is like your, you know, you have, you, how you have default settings. You get a new phone and there's all these default settings, default ringtones, default. It means it's that automatically unless you change it. Unless something changes, right? Our default setting is love. Our default setting is free. Our default setting is the righteousness of God in Christ. That's our default. So if we're not manifesting that, it means there's something that just got inside of us. Do you know the marvel and mystery of our immune system? Have you ever studied that since high school? I needed a refresher on it. I just knew that it's one of the many things that makes me think, and you really believe this evolved all by itself? It's like there are different kinds. I always remembered it as there's one kind of white blood cell. There's all kinds of different white blood cells. There's one set of white blood cells that travels around our blood looking for something foreign that doesn't belong. That's not the thing that attacks it. It goes back to where are white blood cells made? I'm looking at the nurse. <laughs> I didn't mean to give you a test right on the spot. It goes back to the factory in our body, wherever white blood cells are made, and it gives a blueprint pattern specifically for that virus or bacteria or whatever it is, fungus, whatever it is, it goes back with a blueprint so that it can be manufactured just specifically for that foreign invader. Then our body manufactures tons of those. That's actually when you're tested for a disease, they're testing for those white blood cells. They're not, they're not looking for the disease, they're looking for your body's immune system response to it. And then those go out and they lock in on that foreign invader, make it dead, they nullify it, they totally destroy it. And then you just pee them out of your body. And you never even knew it happened. Unless the system fails, and then you get sick. Isn't that amazing? That's what the Spirit of God is doing on the inside of us 24-7, even when we're not asking Him to. So the only way for us to get sick again with sin is when we agree that somehow it has power over us or we willfully give ourselves over and practice sin. You want to build an unrighteous, demonic stronghold? Keep practicing sin. Practice makes perfect, right? When we practice sin, when we give ourselves permission to engage in something that we know is sinful, we are willfully, brick by brick, building a stronghold that Jesus long since destroyed. It's like drinking that virus that your body is trying to destroy. It's like willingly inf reinfecting ourselves with something that the insides of us has already begun to reject. This doesn't belong. This isn't who I am. This is not now uh, a native of this territory any longer. This is a foreign invader, literally. So that's what we do. So Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, we're already free of that stuff. Already free. So we've been given a new nature, and that makes us the incarnation of love. So when we talk about sin, what we mean is there's a love deficit. There are sins of the flesh, to be sure. And what that does is it, like, it weakens us. It makes us less able to walk in the Spirit. But most of us, when we talk about strongholds and we talk about the sin that we contend with, it has to do with relationships in the area of love. Because in the bottom line, although there's a lot of practical work to be done to renew the earth and make it look like paradise again, where it begins is in the realm of relationships. 99 out of 100% of all pain comes from relationships. It comes from some kind of love deficit that we've either given and now we're, we're reaping what we sowed or didn't sow, or things that we've received from other people who either on purpose hurt us or just fell short in their love for us. The solution for all of it is still the same. We have the capacity to be the incarnation of the love of God, which never runs dry. God has never once reacted to anything. Never. You can't tweak God 
like he's some pagan deity that'll then do something because you just rubbed him the wrong way. God has never once lived, never once done anything that way. God can't be moved. God is proactive, and when God does something, it's intentional, and it's always with the motive of love. So, read this together with me. Other people are not the problem. You'll put that up on the mirror in your bathroom. Other people are not my problem. I mean, I don't mean that in the wrong sense. I don't mean that like in the, am I my brother's keeper sense. Yeah, we are a brother's keeper. Other people are not the reason why I do what I do. Nobody can make me do anything. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. It's nobody else's fault. It's not my mom or dad's fault I'm the way I am. It's not my sibling's fault the way I am. It's not Ms. Opitz, my third grade teacher's fault that I am the way I am. It is nobody's fault. If there is something that creates a love deficit from my heart to others, I'm going to look on the inside and say, Jesus, thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, I am free from this love deficit. I am free from the chains that prevent me from manifesting 100% of the love that I've received. We have received incomprehensible love. The moment we turned our mind and heart toward God and like the prodigal son came running home and said, Daddy, make me a servant. I'm not even worthy of being called your son. Before we even finished that prayer, whatever form it came out, God was already putting the ring on our finger, the shoes on our feet, and the robe on our back. We have been given that kind of love. The love of God has been, I love the phrase in the scripture, shed abroad in our heart, meaning it covered every part of our heart. There is no part of our being that God's love hasn't already penetrated. So if we're falling short in it, it means there's something resisting the manifestation of that love. And that's what we call strongholds. So... I'll just start this, and then we'll, uh, we'll really go after it next week, and I'll show you how personal strongholds, re- releasing the saints from personal strongholds, one life at a time rescuing others from their demonic strongholds, is how we engage in the atmosphere of principal war, uh, principalities and powers, spiritual warfare. Because if there's no heart for these strongholds to reside in, then the enemy has no stronghold any longer in a region. That's a lot less stressful than screaming in a prayer meeting at principalities and powers. It involves a lot more work, though, because these are stubborn things. These are like, and the longer they've been there and the more ancient in our lives they are, the more it is like, um, you ever pull bushes out of your garden? We just pulled a rhododendron out of our yard. Ben Ben and I were barking because we got the, you know, we uncovered it, put the chain around the roots of it, and then I let Ben get in there and gun it. And, you know, it's this explosion of dirt. And we go, it's just so much fun to do that, isn't it? These are even more fun to uproot. Because <laughs> now I can plant a new bush over there that's more attractive and not gnarly looking like this thing. But when we get rid of these things, the really deeply rooted demonic strongholds in our heart, life, and that more abundantly. Our spouses our kids, our co-workers, the entire world around us will be rejoicing when these things get uprooted out of our lives. They don't belong, and I'm telling you that they're easier to uproot than we think. Or I should say, they're simpler to uproot than we think. It's just that many times we've been going about it all wrong because what we find out that Paul revealed, by the way, this to a church who was involved in a four-way split in the middle of an outpouring of the Spirit, a four-way split. A church that had, as Paul put it, you lag behind and no gift. Every one of the gifts flowing, miraculous outpouring of the Spirit of God. And in the middle of all that, a four-way split was going on in the church. And they'd forgotten about the basic law of love in the middle of all of it. It's a fascinating study, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Awesome books for the church to to really grab hold of. So in the middle of this, Paul said, he was putting on his fatherly voice, and in a nutshell, this whole section, I'll call it, don't make me come down there. (laughs) Because the church is fighting and beating up on each other, 
And regardless of the supernatural witness of the Spirit of God at work in their midst, they were about to become a byword to the entirety of Greece. As soon as everybody found out, oh, those Christians, they preach a gospel of love, but they can't even get along with their own selves. And they're all yelling at each other and shaking their fists in the middle of church services and splitting and, and all this kind of stuff. They got, you know, instead of just the church of Corinth, it was going to be like the first church of Paul Corinth, the first church of Peter in Corinth and all this. So Paul said, all right, here's what we're going to do this. Though we walk in the flesh, meaning we might be incarnate right now, we're, we're in flesh bodies, we don't war according to the flesh. I'm not going to stoop down and war in the realm where demons live, which is under the feet of the saints, remember? I'm not going to stoop down and go to that place. We don't war according to the flesh. However, that doesn't mean we don't have weapons of warfare. It's just that they're not carnal. Name some, preach with me. What are some carnal weapons that we use to solve problems? Control. What was that? Control. Manipulation. What was that? Blame. Ignore people. Cut off my love. You don't exist. We justify. We justify like our sin. We ju- we're allowed to do this, but you're not. Justify. What else? Rejection. Apathy. Apathy. Deceit. Uh-huh. Those, that's a good start. I bet there's a whole lot more in the kingdom of darkness arsenal than that. Those are the ways that typically humans get what they want. That's how the kingdom of darkness works. And as I shared with you, even if it's for a righteous cause, to use the tools of darkness to try to achieve the kingdom of light just reinforces the kingdom of darkness. We cannot fight the kingdom of darkness with its own weapons. We have much more powerful weapons. The weapon of love, the weapon of what the kingdom of heaven has to offer is divinely powerful. Does that mean my time's up? <laughs> it's divinely powerful, meaning it gets its strength from heaven. This is, these are God weapons right here, meaning the kind of weapons that we're going to tear strongholds down with require no human effort, just human agreement. I'll let that one settle. They're divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses or strongholds. I'll describe what those mean in a minute. What are we destroying? What are strongholds made of? We're destroying speculations. Every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And what are we doing? We're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Where is the war? Right between the, our ears. Those are the ears. Right, right in between here. This is where the war. Every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So speculations are, it means when we say things like, oh, I know what he's like, and so we think we know what he is going to say or do. Or, I know how this is going to turn out. We speculate. That happened to me because I'm a bad person. Or, this keeps going on in my life because everybody around me is just a I can't think of a nice word to say of the pulpit. That's the reason why all this stuff is going on. Speculations, meaning I think I know. It's like false uh, false prophecy. I think I know your motive. I think I know why you're doing what you do. I think I know why this is happening. Those are speculations. And that's not a, a, a prophetic spirit. That's a pathetic spirit. How many knows a fine line sometimes? between prophetic and pathetic. We don't know. Husbands and wives, hear me. We don't know why she did what she did. Not till she tells us. No, you don't know why he didn't do what he didn't do. Not until he tells you. The best source of information for why somebody did what they did is the one who did or didn't do it. Speculations in relationships. Oh, I know why my boss really did that, because he's conniving for position over here. Speculations. 
Also judgment, that's another way of translating that word. I have judged, I weighed whatever evidence I had to work with and I made a judgment, a conclusion about this thing. The way the demonic realm works is it steers our attention, it whispers in our ears. How many of you know that when you're offended with somebody, everything they do is wrong? You ever notice that? And what's amazing is nobody is ever wrong 100% of the time. We see it played out on a grand scale with our president right now. I'm not making a political statement of what he's right about, what he's wrong about. But I do know that the man's not wrong every time he opens his mouth. But there are some that believe that with all their hearts. When we're offended with somebody, everything they do is wrong. Because we're spec... I know why you really did that. You brought me flowers, but you're just trying to manipulate me to do what you want me to do. That's a speculation. That's what spiritual weapons are for destroying. We are destroying every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. So the knowledge of God would be God's perspective on something. That's what that means. God's perspective. How do you prevent the building of strongholds, by the way? Get God's perspective on everything that happens in life. Don't process any life event especially the really painful ones, without sitting with Jesus. Don't come to a speculation, a judgment, a conclusion without involving God in those thoughts. If we do come to conclusions without involving the Father's perspective, you'd best believe that the whisperer wants to get his perspective in there. That happened to you because all men are just like that, you know. Because that man did that thing to you when you were little. And now you know all men are like that. And that's why that man really did that to you. All of these whisperings going on. The knowledge of God is where we sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where we belong. Where we rest back in the lap of God. And say, Daddy, that really hurt. My kids have come home from school or come back from various events. And I can see on their countenance as soon as they walk in the door. Oh, what happened today? And I, as a dad, will not let them get through the room without some snuggle time on dad's lap. Tell me what happened. I want to help you process that so you don't believe that that name that kid called you is anywhere near true about you. Let me process that with you. Let me help you to see another way of looking at that. Let me help you see the highest perspective that exists against that. So that's the knowledge of God. It's God's perspective, God's angle on what happened. The not raised, lofty things raised up against that are places of pride. That simply means, here is, here's what God's perspective is. Oh, I got a better idea than that. I think I know better what happened. I know that, you know, all that Jesus talk and all that, you know, whatever that scripture that eight people quoted me today, what that says. But I know what's really going on. That's a lofty thing. It literally means a place of pride. It's a tower being built up to try to get higher than something else. So in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that is where the name above all names sits. That's where everything is ruled from that realm. A lofty thing raised up against it is when we argue literally with God's word, with God's truth, with God's presence. So yeah, God says that I'm forgiven, but I'm not feeling forgiven. So I think actually I'm not worthy of salvation and I'm just going to pack it in and go off somewhere else. That is a lofty thing raised up against the... It doesn't feel like pride, does it? But it actually is. If God says, I forgive you, yeah, I saw what you did. I knew what you were going to do before you were even born. Yes, I saw all of that. And I still say, you're clean, you're forgiven, you're worthy. A lofty thing raised up in our heart argues with that and says, no, I'm not worthy. I'm not, I know what you say, but I know better. So I'm just going to go and lock myself in my room. I'll send myself to the room right now, and I'll avoid everybody, and I'll avoid you, and I'll keep away from everybody right now. That is literally what that word means. A lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, which is why we take every thought captive. If there's a thought, as I love how Bill Johnson says this, if there's a thought in my mind that didn't originate in heaven, it doesn't belong in there. Those are the thoughts we take captive. Those are the thoughts. When there's a thought that says you're not worthy, you're a sinner, you're stupid, you're ugly, you're fat, you're whatever it is, name it. 
You can probably have your own dozen words that come up that somebody said on behalf of the accuser, unwittingly usually, nobody really on purpose, most of the time, does it on purpose. The careless words that fly out of our mouths are the ones, right? Those are the ones that sting. I can remember things that my dad said in his anger from when I was five years old. I can remember it. I can see his face as if it was yesterday. Those are the ones, right? So those are the thoughts. They come back up. Here's how these things work. Those thoughts got planted in there. Five-year-old Steve believed something that his dad said to him that made me feel a certain way. Five-year-old Steve interpreted that. It wasn't until 48-year-old Steve realized, I've been believing that lie for the last 43 years of my life. What? Took that thought captive, and here's what you do with a prisoner of war. You shake it down. Don't waterboard it. That's, that's torture. It's illegal. You shake it down. I'm just being funny. Shake it down. Interrogate it. And say, how did you get here? You don't belong in my mind. This is the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ doesn't think like this. The mind of Christ doesn't think you can never do this. The mind of Christ doesn't say you're stupid. The mind of Christ doesn't say you're worthless, you're this, that, or the other thing like that. That's not what the mind of Christ says. So how did you get here? And do you have any others waiting in that stronghold? Because that's what a stronghold is, right? It's where thoughts bury themselves inside of us. And so in moments of opportunity, they come rushing out. If we have a stronghold that's based in bitterness, in a moment of opportunity, all that bitterness that's been hiding behind those walls, all of a sudden somebody tweaks us, triggers us. Can I use that with the millennial generation? Some triggers us, and then whoo, out of our mouth, draw gate comes down, draw bridge down, and all of those thoughts come flying out of our mouth toward whoever just offended us. I'll just describe 70 or 80% of all marital conflict right there. That's what happens. You triggered something and your spouse that had nothing to do with you. Maybe a little bit because you did do something bad, but not as big as what just came back at you. You ever feel that? Come on, you can shake your head. It's all right. We've all experienced it. It's why it's in the Bible from 2,000 years ago. And none knew about this stuff. This is what we're like. So that's how these things work. We take those thoughts captive to what? The obedience of Christ. Let me be careful to make sure we understand what that means because I don't want to let you go thinking I just laid down some religious rule for you so you could discipline yourself and take those thoughts and rule over your thoughts. No, the obedience of Christ means Christ's obedience. He already did something about that issue, right? He already crucified that issue. His obedience was now gifted to us as if we'd obeyed God in the first place. That, that's salvation. That's what we got. That's why we know that God's not actually fair. Because it's not fair that we got that. The obedience of Christ means I'm taking all of this and realizing that I've been trying to put this stronghold down for however many years, and all it does is get stronger. And so now it's time for me to take these thoughts and put them into Christ. Here, here's a sure way to have victory in areas of life. As if we invite Jesus into that area instead of trying to keep him out. I don't want you to see this, Jesus. You know, it gets ugly in here. Oh, I didn't know. He lives in there. He's already explored all the territory of our heart. There ain't nothing he's going to find out. He's going to go, ew, I'm not touching that. He's just not like that. Taking our thought captive to the obedience of Christ is to say, Jesus, I am your righteousness right now. I'm not feeling it. Because this thing just happened, this thing that I did, this thing that I thought, this thing I said, it just happened. I'm not feeling it right now, but then these thoughts right now are accusing me. You know what's an awesome truth, too, from the Scriptures? If our hearts condemn us. Does anybody know the finish that verse? God is greater than our hearts. Even if the accusation comes from inside us, the part that knows us the best, God's greater than that. So we take those thoughts and we say these things stirring around in my mind right now, Jesus, I'm putting them in you. I'm, I'm going to go back to how I've been crucified with Christ 
and it's no longer I that lives. I'm not going to strive and resist this thing. Those are the carnal weapons. They're no good against these things. Discipline, self-control, all those self-motivated effort, that never works. But it always works when I say, I need you, Jesus. And I'm taking these thoughts and I'm putting them under your feet. Now help me with this. I need you right now. So Jesus, we confess that we need you in these moments. And we say right now that we're, we're stepping into a ceasing from striving. If there's any labor that's going to be found in us, it's going to be a labor to enter into your rest. Take all of our striving, even now bring to mind the strongholds that exist in our way of thinking. Things that we, we, we think and believe that are contrary to what your truth says. What your truth says to us, what your truth says about us. Reveal them so that we could take those thoughts. Give it, give it to us like a reflexive practice. We pray that in those moments when we're arguing with you, that you'll settle our hearts into a place where we can just lay these things at your feet and trust you to speak. Let your weapon of love melt our hearts into sweet submission to all of what it is that you have for us. Lord, we willingly step into your promise that who the Son has set free is really, really free. Free indeed. Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right, we'll, we'll do some more of this next week, all right? More strongholds, more tearing down. Freedom's an awesome thing. I, I just, I'm addicted to freedom. I love freedom, man. I, and every time I think of my testimony, I'm even more addicted to it. So have an awesome week in Jesus. I'll see some of you guys Wednesday. And um, yeah, have an awesome time out there. Love you guys.